Welcome back to the Compound Podcast. This is episode 99. We had two 98s and then this is 99. Brought to you by Parse Rum. My favorite rum, your favorite rum, Parse Rum. Which you can get at Benny's in Illinois, Specs in Texas. And also... Some I wine didn't... shops in New York that I looked up and I forget the yes. name of. Yes. And places in Florida. Total Wine, maybe. Uh, I... I did not forget my microphone. I just forgot my microphone in the car. So uh, maybe my audio's shit right now. And maybe Tom's mad at me, but it won't be like this forever. I am currently in Arizona. Dakota's in Arizona. 10 minutes from each other. We're 10 minutes from each other. It's special. And I think we're going to do episode 101 in person. Can't say that, Tom. Can't say can. that. You can say that. Yes, I can say that. You can say it. Okay. Does everybody, people know about, can I keep talking? Yeah, you can keep talking about it. Well, John Boy's coming out to Arizona and they're going to be hanging out in person. So Dakota and I are going to record 101 uh, together in person. John Boy is bringing baseball back because by the time they're here, spring training will be going. That's a guarantee. That's a compound guarantee. Oh, is that so? Is that so? Well, I didn't say big league or minor league, but there will be at least minor league games by that point. Can we, Tom, can we tell the people about episode 100 before we get going on this? Also, I'd like to put it out there that I'm cooked. So if my energy is slow, it's not my fault. Listen, we all, I got energy for you. Uh, and we got, uh, we set up, it took me a while today. Shout out to BBD, master producer over here at uh, John Boy. We do have a phone number so people can call in and leave voicemails. Uh, the number is, all right, ready? We'll put this on the screen as well if you're watching at home. 914. 914- 487-3788. So again, that's 914-487-3788. Uh, I just remembered I have to set up the voicemail for it, so I'll have to record a message so you'll hear me. Don't know what I'm going to say. Going to tell you to leave a voicemail. But, uh, you know, do we want them to leave questions? What do we want from the people? Do we want to shout? Do we want just, you know, what do we want? No, I think that's, I think that's a good question that we should discuss on air on episode 99. Uh, which is, I think, I think questions, uh, and maybe a little, maybe if you want to say about what you like about the compound, maybe if you want to fluff us a little bit, tell us how great it is. But please don't I think, be mean. Please don't yeah, bully us. Please, please don't be mean. Well, we have, uh, we have control. Fragile. We have control over which ones get in the episode. So oh, like, oh then yeah, say whatever you want. And Tom, just don't tell us if anyone's mean because you send don't, us YouTube yeah. comments that are mean sometimes. <laughs> I don't even want to see it because I don't care. Don't tell us. Don't tell us uh, anything mean, and um, maybe we only get like five calls, and then Tom has to play the mean ones for us because there's not enough. Like that's a real possibility. If anyone's watching this on YouTube, I want you to tell me if Zach's looked at the screen until this very moment on this whole episode so far. You guys are tra- hey, I know what's going on. I'm not going to interrupt. What's the phone number? What's the phone number? If you know, nine one nine one four something 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 something. And you haven't you have not made a message for it yet. Um, you said you're going to. Ian um, said that he's he cooked. Should, he should fluff. Yeah, he's cooked. Maybe to fluff us up. You guys don't want any mean comments. I can multitask. You want the mean comments? Hey, I want everything. I don't care. I want the real people. Why? What, what good is it going to be if you only see the positive stuff? What do you want from I mean, the people on these on these voicemails for episode 100? Are we doing a pizza party? Yeah, so I, mean, I, I mean, we can no get Grimaldi's. We can no get Grimaldi's. Ads, Dakota and I are going to be eating Grimaldi's. 100 percent. we need to get grimaldi's and then you're gonna have to come pick me up though and then we can get grimaldi's because i don't have a car by the way the phone number again 914-487-3788 as ian gets his microphone set up and that'll be on that'll be on the screen for everybody listening at home how's that tom Nice. They're watching at home. They're not listening. At sorry, home. Dakota. How's that? Not you, Tom. Sorry. No, they're they're watching. They're not listening. If they're listening, then they could just hear it. Correct. Do I sound better now? Oh, yeah, wow. You... Night wow. Wow, you just made Tom's night. Actually, holding this microphone has given me a jolt of energy. It's made me feel like a real podcaster. We'll, we'll circle back to this, but episode 100, we're going to tweet out, and maybe maybe we'll have a better tweet for the people about episode 100 and what what we'd like people to do with those voicemails. But for right now, I guess we should start as we've started every episode for the last fucking 
six months talking about this lockout. Uh, I was in West Palm. Uh, it was an interesting few days, but it was more over. And I said this on the radio the other day, the concept of being at home and like trying to get, cause I had kind of a set date where I was going to leave for Arizona, no matter what was happening uh, and being at home and basically being like, Hey, we're going to meet in New York and then trying to scramble to schedule something to get to New York. And then like, just kidding, it's West Palm and then scrambling to schedule something, go to West Palm literally without a return flight. I was able to see our good friend, Anthony Rizzo for a few days. We worked out together for a while, which was great. He looks awesome. Some people he was hitting in a Cubs helmet. Just saying. He was hitting in the Cubs helmet. He's wearing Cubs batting gloves. Ian was doing some recruiting. (laughs) Tampering? No. I mean, it's not really recruiting. The guy played here for 10 years. I don't think he he knows what's going to happen. I was was telling him all the cool things that are happening in Chicago. You ever been to Navy Pier? Come on. Come on down. Yeah. Yeah. You ever been been down there? You ever had a a deep dish pie? Uh, But it was great to see him and hang out and get to work out together. And then uh, I was driving up from, because Anthony lives um, in more little south of uh, the where West Palm. And so I was driving back and forth. And let me tell you something about traffic in Florida right now. Not great. Not great. Horrid. Uh, put a lot of miles on the rental car. But I was in the room for the meetings. It was uh, a cool experience, I guess, to actually be there in person and do it. And I, because we didn't really talk that much in Dallas, there was just not that many meetings. Um, but um, I don't know what all I can say about it, but slightly frustrating. Uh, the days I was there, we didn't get a lot done. Sometimes it felt like there was progress and then things went backwards. Uh, but I feel like, wouldn't you say the biggest thing of note that's happened the last couple days is when what concessions did the PA make in their offer on Saturday and the MLB said like no like that's not even that still does nothing for us yeah that was a crazy one when we came off our um it was super two right like you got rid of super two arbitration uh and they just said no we still don't care yeah they said we still don't care uh we don't we don't even think that's a valid proposal. I was like, what? We just, yeah, I it's could, like, it was like a hundred million dollar move. It's like, no, we're good. I could be so, wrong just because it's based on what I see in media, but like, it seems almost like the PA is just negotiating against itself right now. Like they're just sending in new stuff and the MLB is like, no. Would you agree or disagree with that? You know, it's a really frustrating negotiating partner is someone that just says no all the time. Mm -hmm. but yeah it really has felt like the pa has been the one trying to move the ball uh to a place where you might get a deal and hasn't been really reciprocated um but there was some some pretty good media today kind of all across the board uh as we kind of approach this set deadline um from the league Uh, and it's i think the jeter stuff that came out was just a crazy bomb in the middle of the whole thing unbelievable well first of all Zach, you jumped the gun on your tweet to us. You said this guy oh, blew yeah, it up and then just said, that. nah, I'm out. I'm like, well, wait a second. He's the goat. Yeah, I mean, there was, was a reason. That was, kind of like a, that was kind of like a joke. And then mm-hmm. and then he yeah, said now that. it was a joke. <laughs> yeah, because he's look what he did before he, he left. They got Wendell Stallings. Didn't Lazardo go? Oh, no, he got didn't he? Didn't Lazardo go there? I mean, they have so much young talent right now. Like, their staff. They have one of the best, like, young pitching staffs in the the NL. And it was so sick what he said of, like, without, like, bashing the Marlins, just being like, yeah, I came here to try to help them win. It doesn't seem like that's their top priority. I don't know how to do this job if it's not to win games. That was sick. Can you imagine being a GM or president or whatever, the top dog, and trying to go – and a part owner and trying to go to the ownership group being like, look, I, you gotta give me, I don't know what their payroll is right now, Tom, what's their payroll, but like, you gotta give me $115 million to compete or you gotta give me one thirty to compete. And they're like, ah, another 20 can't do it. Not going to happen. That's the craziest part is he stepped down from everything. He has no more stake in the team. Like he's like, I'm, I'm out like that. Like, you're done. He gave up his 4%. 
I well, thought I saw she's that. Probably, yes, but he, I'm sure he sold it. He oh, just, yeah. No, he oh, didn't like, give it back to him. Like, here you go. No, 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 he's out. Yeah, he sold it. As of right now, and obviously a lot of moves left to be made, according to SpotRack, uh, they have $70 million in payroll. Uh, their projected uh, competitive balance payroll is $88 million. So, so I don't know quite the difference between those two of those, but it's somewhere between yeah. 70 and 80. Million. Yeah. It's like, what is he asking for? 110? He's like, give me to 110. That's did you just, see? I don't want to talk about it. Did you see Passan's article? Cooked. Ian? Zach's boy's yes. article? It was great. That was, was sick. Long. I think that was, that's the, the toughest part about this is there's been so many moving parts and in the entire negotiation. And it's hard to get it out in one tweet or something like when there's a piece like that that encompasses all of the stuff that's going on it's just it's an awesome read because you see all the different that's what we've been dealing with for the last six months it's like how do we make all of these things with competitiveness and each different move that you have with competitiveness where there's the draft or revenue sharing or international draft or all this stuff it all impacts how teams are going to compete and then like the group of players has to try to predict how 30 teams 30 owners and 30 gms are going to react to rule changes because of the last five years are just so insane with the with the manipulation of the rules and i think uh your boy jp did an awesome job of kind of breaking all that down and then kind of giving examples about, about how uh you know things have happened over the over the last five years i thought there was one there was a quote from a gm in there wasn't it that was like yeah we don't want to manipulate service time but if it's there like how do we not yeah it's it's very long but it is very worth the read if you're like not i guess like knowledgeable of what's going on it, he he gives a lot of insight i took a screenshot of that quote because i was like oh my god and sent it to a couple people uh the quote from that article is this is from an unnamed general manager right now in major leagues. It's horrible. Six years should be six years, but what are we supposed to do? Not take advantage of them? See, and the thing is, I'll be honest, they're right. Because if I'm a GM, why wouldn't you? do it? Like right. you get an extra year of a player. Of course, you're like Brendan Davis right now. You're telling me if you can get an extra year of that guy. Sure. Like Chris Bryant, like, why wouldn't you do it? Like it's, it's a bad rule. That's the thing. It's like, it's just a it, bad system. It's that that's right. allowed. It's business. You're not just going to light mm-hmm. your money on fire because 100%. it's the right thing to do. You know, like, yeah. I, and the, the, the frustrating part is that both sides acknowledge that it's an issue. Everybody in the game acknowledges like, Hey, this isn't good for the game. Like, Chris Bryant shouldn't be fighting his team after winning rookie of the year to prove that he deserves a full year of service. Uh, but you know, nobody is can get on the same page about how to figure it out or, or what the best way is uh, for teams not to do it anymore. So it's, it's tough. And as players, it's tough to get into the minds of owners and GMs and predict how they're going to react to different rules changes uh, over the next five years. It's really hard. I saw somebody, uh, I think one of the MLB concessions was that uh, anyone who finishes top two in rookie of the year will automatically get a a full year of service time now. And then I saw, which I was like, all right, that's something positive. And then one of the first replies to that tweet was saying, oh, great. Now teams out of the race will just take their rookie of the year candidates and bench them for the last month. And like, that's not out of the question of what teams. No, that's, and that's, that's the fear. That's the fear. Or if a dude's trying to, play through being a little bit banged up like you're telling me jonathan india or any of these dudes right they're young they're playing their first 162 it's grueling and uh guys get banged up in september and you're telling me that that those guys aren't going to be like hey man why don't you just take the last few weeks take the last month like well let's get you healthy for next year like if you're a young kid and you're you're being told to do that by your front office it's a really hard situation to say no um but what does that say about the sport that we think even a rule that I think everyone would agree in general, the idea of giving guys who get rookie of the year an automatic year of service time. That's a good rule in the hypothetical. We immediately go to, well, how will MLB teams use this to screw over players? Yeah. I mean, that's where we're at. Right. I mean that even the rules that MLB proposes that we think are good rules, we immediately go, Oh, well, but then how will this in fact actually hurt the players? I mean, Told you I was fired up. I'm trying. I'm trying to stay calm because I. But I've been real fire. I mean, it's been the last week watching the media reports that come out have been very frustrating. And I think it's 
interesting compared to other past lockouts where now the players can talk directly to fans, right? Social media has really changed the game. And I do think more fans are kind of seeing through, hey, the players want to play. The players are asking for the bare minimum and they're still not even getting anywhere close to it. And I think that's the one thing the players have going for them right now is that I think the fan support is on their side. We'll see what happens and if this keeps going on and on. But boy, has this week been disheartening. Ian, can you bring a guest into the meetings? Because I need you to get Tom into that meeting room. There will be a you deal know, done like that. You know how amazing it would be if – one of the funny things is when uh, – you know, whether it's a 14 team playoff or something else and you know, MLB's one of the one of the lines is you know this is what the fans want it's like I would love to put a group of fans in that room and just be like hey guys what do you, what do you think about 14 team playoffs why don't you just tell why don't you tell what you think uh, everybody on Twitter is bashing 14 games Twitter or four, 14 games <laughs> did you just have a stroke 14 game you said playoff. 14 games Twitter <laughs> On Twitter, everybody is bashing like the 14 game playoff. 14 like, team. 14 team. There's Whatever. 14 teams. It's not Twitter. It's not games. There's 14 <laughs> teams in the playoff. That's the proposal. Zach wants 14 game series. It's just out there wild. That was Wasn't there fun. something like crazy, like a ghost win or something, and like the two games are at home, like something outrageous? Yeah. Wasn't that by There's the players? Like- there's a lot of crazy ideas being floated to try to figure out how to incentivize the division winners to want to win the division. So like if, if being the one seed or being the seven seed doesn't have that much difference in competitiveness, you know, it's how do you incentivize, you know, division winners two and three. Cause really yeah. I think in this, in, in this system, the one gets a buy. So you'd have to incentivize division winners two and three to go win because if what? not, Two plays seven, three plays six, and four plays five. Uh, and, you know, besides the fact that you get three home games uh, in that first round, there's no incentive to win the division. So you want teams to be going out and spending to win 95 games, and get mm-hmm. those extra free agents. But if there's no incentive to win the division, it kind of makes 162 seem a little pointless. I have an, an actual question, Ian. And this could be a dumb question. So like the CBT obviously is a big deal. And that's about like raising the luxury tax, right? But why would that make teams spend money that already don't spend money? That's my question. Like if say the pirates or something like a team that doesn't have a big payroll, like why just cause it's higher, are they all of a sudden going to go spend 200 million instead of, or like the Marlins instead of like a hundred. Pirates, Marlins, A's raise those teams. You know, they're never going to be spending what the Yankees or the Dodgers are going to spend. Yeah. But um, there's it's kind of twofold. One, if there's 10 teams that are spending 220, obviously, as Derek Jeter can say, you can't compete at 80. Mm-hmm. So it's good. they're going to have to spend incrementally more to keep up with those teams. But the second part of that is there's about five to seven teams a year using the luxury tax as a hard cap where they won't go over it. And then they tell free agents, hey, can't sign you. Hey, you have to sign this deal. Hey, we have to spread the money out to stay under this threshold uh, because it's, you know, we're, we're not willing to go over it. I can't, I can't get authorization to go over it. So you have a group of teams and you know, whatever it was last year, 210 or 208 or something. And they have a group of teams that's sitting right around 200 um, with a little bit of room up to it. Or, you know, oh, we got to save a little bit of room because we might want to make a trade at the deadline to add some money. There's a lot of teams that are just sitting under it. So if you raise that, uh, you know, those teams like the Cubs, the Red Sox, the Dodgers that always have to come down and reset, um, those teams would be willing to push up another 10, 15 million a year um, and, and still be butting up to it uh, if it's a little bit higher. Does that hurt competitive balance? I don't think it hurts competitive balance because I think that baseball – now, baseball is a sport where the teams that spend more generally, you know, win more of a percentage of the games, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee that that team's going to yeah. win the World Series. Like otherwise uh, the Dodgers and Yankees would win every single year. Would every single year. And so, you know, I think, I think, and the, the other part of like competitive balance is 
was the the mid market teams and the rebuilding feeling like with the Tigers or the Royals when they go spend money they can only keep that payroll up for a couple of years before they have to kind of reset it. So we wanted a system where teams are being rewarded for making the playoffs with draft picks for going out and winning where they're getting uh, draft picks instead of being penalized for being good teams. Um, and then the lottery, which kind of changed that race to the bottom deal. So like if you're losing every year, it's harder to rebuild instead of playing well, spending a little bit more and then continuing to get draft picks to reinvigorate the system. Again, playing kind of devil's advocate here. It's like, I totally understand why some owners are scared of like, you know, the Cohen owners who are just like, yeah, fuck the luxury tax, whatever it is. I'm going to spend whatever it is. And it's like, no matter what they're going to get penalized, they're still going to do it where it's like, Hey, we can't, I mean, I don't know if they can or can't afford it, but it's like, no matter what we do. And then if we keep losing because we're so much below those guys, we're going to get penalized for it. And it's like, that's what I mean. Like, this is devil's advocate. I'm not calling them that they don't have the money because they do, but it's like, I understand where they're coming from. Yeah. It's just the difference between teams having 60 to $80 million payrolls. And then like, you know, 150. if, if, if teams are, if teams are up there in 125, 150 range, you know, that's, they're competing with teams that are at 200, 210, 220. Like the, uh, it just, it kind of matters where you're in the life cycle. Like if you have a bunch of free agents, you have a bunch of guys who are kind of the end of that deal versus if you have a bunch of guys who are at the beginning of their arbitration cycle, like good teams can have really good players in, in all different kind of facets of the game, making different amount of money, but still creating similar value. I mean, I think one thing that needs to be kept in mind is that, since 1990, only one team in the bottom half of the MLB payroll has won. Uh, I believe that was the one of the Marlins teams, either 97 or 2003. But plenty of teams have been in that 10 to 15 range and won. Recently, the Royals, uh, the 2002 uh, Angels, the 2011 Cardinals, all were in that 10 to 15 range. And the, these are – you just need to be in the middle of the pack to be competitive. You don't have to be the Yankees. You don't have to spend number one every year. Teams have won World Series being the 15th highest payroll. To that point, Tom, the Braves were 11th last year, 153 million. Like, that's exactly what you were saying. Like, if you're just in the middle area, you could still have plenty of talent to win a World exactly, Series. Right. Totally, totally agree. Yeah. And you're trying, to, you're trying to keep teams from just saying, like, ah, fuck it. I'm going to only spend 75 million this year because if I get to 130 or 150, I still don't think I could win. It's like, that's, it's false. It's and then false. you still got the teams like the Rays. Their payroll last year was still 70 million, 26th in the league. And they were disgusting. Like, you can do a lot if you grow your talent and then like make a splash here or there in free agency. Yeah, they don't even get anybody in free agency. They just build guys from their system, and then when they're about to hit free agency, they're like, "Yeah, we got a few more of you guys coming through. We're gonna take them." Or like at the deadline, they'll they'll go get what they get. Nelson Cruz Cruz this year. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. right. Yeah, but they all they've always fallen short on depth, uh, which is kind of a big like. That's why the Dodgers are always in it. You know, the Astros and they were spending a bunch of money were in it because they just had they had the depth to really weather the storm. It is. Absolutely insane <laughs> that in 2021, the Rays payroll it says is 70 million, and the Dodgers is 271 million. That's so crazy. That had a lot paying- to do. The Dodgers number looks so crazy though because of Bauer and having to go get Scherzer. Yeah, like that number. The pre the number before the year was like 240, I think, or something like. That. Well, and then Bellinger is in ARB, and he was making. 20 18 or something you got like c i don't think seager was on a huge deal last year but yeah it's yes he was seager was in was he back back into our seager i don't know look it up tom what do we got say some numbers at us can we talk about youth baseball i'm cooked on this cba stuff cba is in shambles we're just pretending that the world doesn't exist anymore they're gonna meet literally there's cub fans going to asu games Oh God! I mean, we we were on calls last night. Can we very briefly? I've I can before we switch. I know we want to switch the topic. 
I've just been, I've been thinking about this a lot. And I want to use one guy as just an example, I think, of how baseball right now is fundamentally broken, the financial system and why the players, because I think a lot of fans out there still might not know why the players are holding out. Hockman? No, I, I did think about him, but I just picked a random guy. So I picked someone we actually talked about in the pod, Mike Yastrzemski. Mike Yastrzemski, a 2013 uh, senior sign, right? So he got whatever, five, 10 grand. How much money do you guys think he's earned playing professional baseball? And now the, this will be his age 33 season coming up. Or sorry, 32. He's about to turn 32 this year. What, do you, what does I, he have? Like, I'll, say, I'll say my number last. What, how many years of showtime does he have? He's got three years of showtime. So I'm going to guess. So, so that's like 150. Or sorry, 1.5. And then like the my, I'm going to guess like 2 million, 3 million tops. Yeah. He's, he's earned 1.1 million. In his entire career, Oof. and this is a guy. He didn't hit. He didn't hit Arb yet. This is his first year Arb. This will be his got, first year of Arb. Yeah, I mean he's a little bit hurt by the 2020 year, obviously, where everyone's salaries were uh, less. But I mean, this is a guy oh, who's yeah. playing professional baseball, professional baseball at a high level, right? This is a guy who was in the upper minor leagues in the Orioles system, never got a chance. Gets finally traded to San Francisco because he never again. We talk about minor league service time you gotta have seven years of minor league service time just to become a minor league free agent couldn't do that finally gets traded finally gets an opportunity and now because he's good he's actually getting punished he will not be a free agent until he's turning 36 i mean think about that he'll ne- yeah he'll never be a free agent he'll he'll never basically be a free agent he's been an above average to borderline all-star player the last three years got about eight and a half war and he's made 1.1 million dollars so no sounds like a lot of money but if you think about the lifespan of a major of a baseball player. The fact that this guy's been grinding since 2013 and he finally this year will make two and a half million on our, that's the first time, but because of how seven years of minor league control combined now with six years of team control, it's insane. I mean, this is a system that no other sport has. You look at basketball, you look at football, all these guys sign four year contracts. They're in the, the, in the top level right away. And here in baseball, you can play seven years in the minors, still not be a free agent, then play six years in the majors, and you'll just never be a free agent. I mean, what are we what are we doing? And that's why baseball's financial system is broken. That's just one guy. I just picked a random guy that we had talked about. You go look at anyone else around baseball, service service time manipulation, and the fact that these teams have, as they said. Well, they're like, sorry, we have to take advantage of you because we have no other choice because everyone else is taking advantage of the players. It's just, it doesn't make any sense. It, it was amazing in the room when we were talking, we were talking, sitting there internally talking about service time manipulation, that it didn't matter what player you were, what your background was, if you were a first round pick, if you weren't, if you were a superstar who's now signed an incredible deal or not, everybody had a story about being manipulated. Everybody. Every single player in the room even max scherzer yeah uh all right maybe there's a yeah. one and but, but garrett garrett cole and door like guys had guys had stories about the beginnings of their career and stuff that happened and like everybody you know everybody has something you know, tony riz is three days short of 10 years you now he needs three days once the season starts to be a 10 kb chris bryant was one day short uh, of a year of service, which completely and totally would change. He's going to make a lot of money. He's going to be fine. But like that dude would have been a free agent a year earlier, at 28 going 29, like but in a completely different situation for him. That's probably why they didn't want me at the meetings. Cause I wasn't manipulated for my service time. I told him I'd me too. Back. Me too. How many times you, how many times you get option this year? I don't know. I mean, they were all they're uh They're I mean, still manipulating mine. That's why I haven't been called up yet. It's crazy. It's locked up. <laughs> It is. It's a crazy system, and it's really tough to relate to any other system because uh, almost every other system besides the NHL, because uh, they have a minor league hockey, you know. But yeah, they have, it's like its own league. It's like its own league, but well, so you know, is the every... G League now in basketball. The minor league hockey, I'm pretty sure they get paid all year round too, and they make like you know they make, normal salaries. Sure they, make over, like, pretty sure they make over a hundred grand. I think G League's like that. G League, they make great money, right? G League has like a draft now. It's like its own thing. I think G League salaries are like thirty thousand, and I think hockey is like forty to fifty. But I mean, those are still you talk about compared to minor league yeah. baseball. It's like nine day, three to four times. An NFL uh, practice squad makes like 
I want to say six figures. I could be wrong, but I know it's like 50 K plus. No, they make like a, I think it's like 150. I was going to say, I think it's over a hundred, but I didn't, I didn't want to be wrong. I mean, you look at like your teammate, Evan Longoria, you talk about a guy's service time manipulation took him two years to get to the bigs. Of course, didn't get called up till mid April for, you know, he suddenly was ready in mid April. Cause he, he wasn't ready. ready yet. That's why he, no, wasn't, he ready. wasn't ready in opening day. Then signs a six year, $17 million deal. You're like, why is that? Cause bought out all of his, you know, our beers. And then finally signed a big contract at 29. That's like the perfect scenario. He was drafted at 20, spent two years in the minors, then get called up. But by the time he was the fourth overall pick in his draft, to break a Shaw Ferguson, the NFL draft had already made 55 million by the time he had gotten to his second contract. I mean, it's just, it doesn't get it, the whole system's broken no matter who you look at. And they, and they probably told him, you know, teams will do this. We just saw an example of it with Seattle that if you don't sign an extension, we're going to send you back down or we're not going to bring you up uh, and you're going to wait around. So you can either sign this today and you'll start the season on the open day roster or we'll see you later. And, you know, the Seattle guy talked about it. You know, those dudes that broke camp with the White Sox, a couple of young guys, Eloy and those guys, like had to be part of the conversation, you know. It's a system. I'm cooked. I'm absolutely cooked. Can we talk about youth baseball? Okay, we promise the people. Of I course. just want to live up to our promises to the people. And Tom, if we want to circle back and you want to yell about this for like five minutes before we end, just leave it right fresh in people's minds. We can do that. I'm all yelled out. I'm good. What do you want to talk about youth baseball, Ian? Well, I want to talk about a few things. So I'm going to start with how I thought about this uh, and then circle back because I tweeted about it and then people responded. And I think there's some things to address. But I was talking to a friend of mine who's 11 year old daughter was playing basketball, tore her ACL at 11. 11. You imagine rehabbing an ACL at 11. How's that possible? Aren't your bones and like saying, limbs like really malleable at that you, age? Aren't like, you like, yeah, you like can't do anything. Like, you could like break your arm, but that's about it. So I, it's, it's an interesting t- topic about youth sports uh, and youth baseball specifically, but there's, you know, injuries are as high as ever because kids are lifting earlier. Kids are playing more. Kids are more specialized. They're more one-sided athletes. Uh, Tommy Johnson through say, the roof. I wouldn't say working out or lifting is hurting the kids getting hurt. One hundred percent. I think it one hundred percent is. Not know. even a question to me. If you start think, lifting weights at the age of twelve, you're putting so much stress putting, on your body that it's I not disagree. ready for. I disagree. I, I think. Mean, I mean, the data supports it. One hundred percent is why. I've seen a lot of conflicting reports about that. Okay. Would you like to speak to them? No, I'm just saying, like, because that's like the narrative. It's like, you know, don't lift until you're fully developed. But I, like I said, like I've heard a lot of conflicting. I've heard both, but I don't think it's one way or another. I don't think it's a hard no that you can't lift before the age of 18. It's dangerous because I think there's a lot of kids out there who want to work hard and want to get in the weight room and do stuff and uh, and and be really good at playing baseball, which is awesome. But I think there's a lot of kids that are doing it the wrong way that don't have the proper instruction that uh, don't, don't have anybody watching their form and they're lifting heavy at a young age and getting too muscular in one spot without the proper flexibility. And then things start to go. Uh, And like, I think all of us had experiences in college had like a football strength coach taking you through workouts who didn't understand anything about being a rotational athlete. And then you know, before you know it, you're too strong in one area or you're competing and you haven't built the proper strength for doing baseball activities and then something goes. That's, I think it's a big issue in youth sports is that there's people who aren't armed with the right information uh, that are taking kids through workouts or practices and then kids are getting hurt. And, that, and like you see kids at the age of 12 and 13 throwing seven ounce balls and then three ounce balls. And it's like, I can guarantee you, you're going to have Tommy John. By the time you graduate college, I, I guess I shouldn't say guarantee, but the chances of if you're throwing a, a baseball is what five ounces or six, I think it's five. If you like do overload underload stuff as hard as you can physically throw a baseball at that age on that elbow, like you're, you're leaving damage that you'll never get rid of. And it blows because my every, mind to watch. 
Yeah, because every player who's played as long as we have, like you have damage. You know, it might not be, you might not have lost your UCL. It might not be all the way, but like if you go there and you do your left arm versus your right arm, like it's that right arm is gross. You know, you're, oh yeah, it's just it's an unnatural motion. It it makes it makes no sense to me some of the stuff people do at like that young age. That's my point of like people are getting hurt because they're trying to do it at in junior high. And I'm like, your body's not ready to take this on. Do you think that if kids had the proper instruction or like the proper, I don't think there's any instruction you need, like other than just pit, like I'm talking like baseball wise, like you don't need to do anything crazy up until high school, like just play baseball, like do like lessons. Like you don't need to, like, how do I get my velo up from 65 to 70? It's like, who cares yeah. if you throw 70 at the age of 13? Nobody. Yeah. My thing is just do it right. Like, have the proper mechanics, work on doing it right, uh, you know, whatever it is, long toss, or if it's it's making sure that your, your workouts are tracking with what you're trying to do. But, like, just have the right movements and motions. And, like, if you can build that foundation, like, you're going to be fine. But if you start – doing just crazy ass movements and trying to max out on everything at the age of like 11. It's like, what? Just throwing a tennis ball against the wall. <laughs> so I mean, it, it, and not that many people have the right instruction. Um, can you read us a couple of the questions that we got from that tweet that we can answer for the people? And let me tell you something about these questions, Tom. These questions from Twitter are presented by Manscaped. Manscaped, code compound, manscaped.com, code compound, 20% off and free shipping. You know, there's uh, a lot of things we have to talk about with Manscaped here. There's uh, hair care, okay? There's cologne. We have this ultra premium package, the new ultra premium collection. We have it again. Don't forget manscaped.com, 20% off, code compound plus free shipping. Uh, and the bundle is hygiene, skin care, hair care. It's whole thing. I think that they're, they're still doing the chapstick, which is, I'm in a chapstick. You know, I am. And don't forget the uh, lawnmower 4.0 with the light. Anything you guys want to say about Manscaped before best we part, take the questions from Tom? Best part about those, it's waterproof. Use it literally yeah. whenever you want. Literally whenever you want. Is the lawnmower 4.0 waterproof? I believe so. Helps reduce nicks too, which is the best part. I don't want any next. No, God, no. Not I wherever you, you gave it. I don't know if you guys listened to uh, Talking Baseball at all, but they had passing on the other day, and they hit him with an ad right when he got on, and he was in the middle of an ad, and it was absolutely hilarious. But it wasn't an ad for Manscaped, so I'm not going to talk about it anymore because I only care about Manscaped. Tom, read us these questions presented by Manscaped, code compound, 20% off. Free shipping. First question. How much youth talent is being missed because of how expensive travel ball is? The, this is a this is an easy one for me. Not an easy one. I think parents waste money on travel ball. I don't think you need to go anywhere. With how much media there is nowadays, coaches see everything. Like there's so much film out there now, I feel like, for like every travel ball team that you don't need to go from Michigan down to Florida for a tournament to be noticed by a team. Like you can play in normal games and then you can have film and like send it and people are going to see it. Like, I don't think, I think it's easy to find people nowadays way easier than it was when we were coming up personally. Zach. I agree. Um, to your point, today's day is way easier to get, um, you know, noticed, especially with the social media, but it also, it's tough. Like if you come from a small area and like you only play Legion or something, it's like, nobody's going to go there. Nobody's going to watch you play. If you can't afford it, no one's going to watch you play, you know, a schoolyard team. Like I had nobody coming to high school games. I had, like, I was in a fortunate enough situation where I, I was playing on a pretty good travel team, kind of like a bunch of the good guys in the area. But like, if I didn't do that, I would have been toast. And I still, I mean, i wasn't really appealing or, you know, eye candy really to a scout. I was 140 pounds. Um, so, I mean, I now still you're a big leaguer. Huh? Now you're a big leaguer. Exactly. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, definitely it's, it, it sucks how expensive it is. It truly is. And especially half the time it's like they write, Oh, I'll look at all these schools that are coming. And then the schools are just there chopping it up with each other, like back to the field, you know, it's just, uh, and the schools are there to usually see one guy, one, one guy, guys, yeah. one guy. Yeah. I just what, think uh, you, you can send so much stuff out. You can send so much out. Use that opportunity as another kid. Hey, he's coming to watch the shortstop and you're the second baseman. Help yourself because he has to watch the game if he's watching him play. Mm-hmm. What did you guys do in high school? Did you play locally? Did you travel around a little bit? Did you do the East Cobb and the perfect See, game stuff? I did travel ball, but the farthest we went was South Bend, Indiana. And then I did like – I did showcases back then, but that's only because this like the media – wasn't as accessible as it is now. Like nowadays, like you don't need to go to a showcase. Like you can just send video to a team. Like I went and threw a showcase and that's how Michigan state saw me, but do you guys Again, make DVDs? So like showcases? If I were to show up at a perfect game showcase with Michigan state there, they would look at me and laugh, but like it has nothing to do five, with you're six, five in high school and you're a big pitcher. You're throwing hard. I'm assuming. No, I know, but well, <laughs> My story is more of an anomaly because I was throwing 82 until the summer before my senior year. I hit 90 at a showcase in front of Michigan State. Like, if I didn't right. do that, I would have never made it. But, like, right. but again, you know, you go to a showcase, you're like, hey, this guy's pretty projectable if we get him throwing hard. I'm Where saying maybe if, it's like, this guy's, I mean, look at him. He's built, he's built like the fun where they're hitting. If you get video of like a summer game nowadays and you're whatever, say you throw 91 as a righty, like, and you send that to a school they're going to notice like right. they're not, they, it's not like these coaches are not trying to find talent. Like they'll find you. <clears throat> you think our listeners are thinking are finding it as funny as I am. Zach just shitting on the high school version of himself. He's Zach's just little, wearing out. He was a little guy. Bro, I was so small. And now and you're like, I was yeah. good. Like I was, don't get me wrong. I was really good, but I, if I, if my, 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 like I said, I don't know if I've said it on here before, like in high, in little league and in, coming up my mom would like give me twenty dollars if i hit a ball out of the infield like that was her incentive like hey let's let's start hitting the ball in the outfield you know like i was fucking small dude it was bad you hit it out of the infield <laughs> bro you have no idea how, how small, small were you dude i told it was 140 pounds my first day of good college. job buddy that reached the grass <laughs> literally I... my mom would drop me off listen my mom would drag me to the gym to go lift. I would go shoot basketball, basketball. And I told him, yeah, I went and lifted today. But that's, I mean, that's what I would do too. Like, come on. I didn't want to fucking lift. I was like, oh, I can, I can just get by hitting singles. I, my path, we didn't really travel much. We, you know, we had a travel team. I think I said AAU and somebody got on me for it. it it's, that was what we called it, AAU. I don't know if you guys called it summer ball, travel ball, but uh, we isn't, had a team that would. Well, isn't AAU just basketball? That's what I what thought. Is, how, how is it just basketball? It doesn't make any sense. Like, that's like what the basketball league is called. It's called like yeah, AAU. AAU. What's it stand for? It's like Cooperstown. Like, there's not a Cooperstown in basketball. Like, I think it stands for AAU. Amateur Athletic uh, something, I guess. There is, there does stand for something, technically. Okay. The, uh, but we traveled around a little bit. We went to the Carolinas a little bit. Uh, and then over to like Joliet, that was kind of as far as we went, but I never did any, like the big perfect game showcases or anything. I, I don't know. I think there's, I think there's so much wasted money in some of these teams. And I think it is crazy what parents are paying for their kids to play baseball and go to these tournaments and feel this. It's just, there's, it's crazy. And like, I, thing- played, I played on that travel team because my, travel coach knew every coach ever so they're gonna listen to him and say hey i have x y and z here you got to come and watch where it's the other coach doesn't know anybody and it's the reputation's kind of you know see colleges are going to be upset that i'm going to say this if you get an invitation to a camp at a college in an email do not waste your money on that it is only if the coach tells you they want to see you come and play there then do that because they send out emails, hundreds of them. And it's literally just to make money. It's how they pay their assistant coaches. Literally. And uh, that's why I feel bad saying it. Cause I'm not trying to like to cause money to them, but I feel bad because the parents are sending kids there and they're like, Oh, my kid's trying out for central Michigan today. I'm like, no, he's not. He's going to play baseball for $300 for two hours. 
let's let's take on the next question i think but before we take on the next question i do think if you're playing high school and playing really good baseball they'll find you 100 percent aau by the way stands for amateur athletic union okay next question is that specific to basketball or not I, you asked me what the name was. You didn't ask. Okay. Me look well, I, appreciate you, I appreciate you finding. I appreciate you finding what the name was. All right. Here comes from Jared. Uh, he said specialization versus the value of playing multiple sports. Would love to hear each of your perspectives with playing other sports and how it helped you with baseball. That's that helped that. me with baseball because uh, it really helped me in the sense of the mental side. Um, didn't play any other sports really. I was actually kind of specialized, so I'm not the right person to ask about this. But I do think if you want to play other sports, you should not give up your other sports for baseball. Unless maybe you're a pitcher who's throwing like 98 and don't break your arm. But you're, I think Zach will agree with me. You're a kid. Like, I don't even care if you're throwing 98. If you want to play basketball, go play basketball. Cause guess what? It's fun as fuck. Like, I, like, yeah, like, People are like, oh, you got to make sacrifice. Like, not in high school, you don't. In high school, go play basketball. If you want to go play basketball, play. If you want to play football, play football. I don't think you should specialize in one sport because you'll miss out on so many other things that are so much fun. Like, I love basketball. I loved playing it 10 times more than I liked playing baseball growing up. I just wasn't very good at it. And I know I think Zach's the same way. Play any sport you can for as long as you can. It helps. I mean, we, we still play golf. Body. It helps everything. And tennis. We, we, yeah, we still play other sports because we like to play other sports. I, I think kids should play. And, and I'm not saying like you could still, like you have to do baseball year round still, though, if you're serious about it. Like it's not like, oh, I only play baseball in the spring and then I forget about it until next spring. Like I still do baseball stuff year round in high school, but I still played basketball. Because it was so much fun. Uh, this one comes from Coach Street. He said, emphasis on the interaction between coaches and parents and volunteer umpires. The negativity directed to volunteer umpires models horrible behavior for kids. Coach, for that question. I, you know what we stop doing when people ask questions, thanking them for being podcasts as guests. So I'd like to thank all the people that ask questions for being guests podcast. Uh, I when I see videos and like think back to how angry parents would get at like umpires or coaches, it blows my mind. It's, it's, I don't understand it. Readable. How much the parents want it more than the kids at the, at this for you tournament in New Jersey. <laughs> it's like, what, it's like, what, how are you going to get mad at a guy for taking his time to come and volunteer and be an umpire and help the kids? And like, yeah. Okay, he doesn't want to be there for 17 hours. He's not calling the fucking perfect zone. He also doesn't know what he's doing. He's just out there. Why don't you get behind the plate if you're going to be? That's what I mean. Huh? It's not. It's not a knock on these umps, but like these guys, like, like like what they took a they took like a quick class. Like hey, like just make sure you call balls and strikes loudly so everyone can hear you. Go get them. Like you think they're trained? Like it, it's unbelievable to see some parents just freak out. I'm like, chill out. Like they literally give them a anymore. shirt in the parking lot and say, Hey man, thanks for coming on. Really yeah. appreciate it. Exactly. And but parents pizza, expect them to be like party. Hall of Fame. They they expect them to have a track man in their ear telling them balls and strikes. Right. Like, what and are we I, doing? I think the other part of that is like if your kid punches out at eleven years old on a ball that was in the other batter's box, like, yeah, it stinks. It's not gonna ruin their baseball career. No, like you're not. You're not taking dollars out of their pocket. Big leaguers get really pissed because those numbers go on the back of the baseball card. The 11 new numbers, they'll make it on the back of the baseball card. True. But I also think interaction between coaches and parents, I think sometimes parents get a little too involved. So let the, let the coaches let the coaches coach. If you want to have a little conversation about it, maybe just tell your kid to smile and nod and do what he wants. I'm a big advocate for if you're taking your kid to a lesson – or like to practice cool. it's not being an, an absentee parent to just drop them off and leave like you don't need to be there and like try to micromanage like you brought them here for a lesson let the coach do the lesson like don't try to get in there we have a if sign you wanna, if you want to be there don't comment we have a sign that says like no parents beyond this point on the outside door 
we're at home. And it's not like, like I said, it's not to be rude. It's just like, no. listen, like, let us work with them. Like, you're paying us not, money to do it. Let us do it. He's not going to perform better when you're like, he's not going to perform well when you're there. Mm-hmm. Like, he's going to feel a pressure of you watching like this, sitting there like, bro, like, go, go to an errand, go run. Yeah. Somewhere, bro. 100%. Okay. Next, next question. This is the last question from the fans who we really appreciate asking us questions. Manscaped.com. For episode 100 and manscaped.com. Backslash, just kidding. It's not a backslash. It's a code compound 20% off. Uh, how important is it for kids to have fun rather than try to be good? And that comes from uh, Cubs Zone. Hey, winning, winning cures all, kid. I was going to say that's really tough because it's about having fun, but it's really fun to win too. Like, I also think it's about the age and like the, yes, the division of competition competitiveness like if you're if you're playing best of the best like yeah well, i mean winning but the competition should be the emphasis should be that the competition is the fun part like yes winning is awesome and losing stinks but like if you're going out there and competing and like joy like i think all of us the reason why we play the game is because we enjoy being in the competition you know obviously you're not always going to come out on the right side of that, but the joy about being in the competition is what brings us back. And again, you're playing with your best friends growing up. Enjoy that. That's fun. That's yeah. fun. As fuck. Yeah. It's like you, know, you will look back and miss the times just playing with kids you grew up with for sure. I think everybody looks back and it's like those travel ball times when you got to go to the hotel oh. and jump in the pool and have a orange slice in between games and like, See, that was high school trips. Like, those are the fun times. That was like you wanted to win then, but it's like you look back and it's like, oh, I don't remember, like, oh, we won this game and then we lost this. It's like, no, like you remember, like you said, going to the pool, doing whatever you do with your buddies, like on the road. Like, that's the fun stuff. But also, like Zach said, winning is also very fun. (laughs) Don't lose the competitive edge, but don't let it control you. Can we finish this episode with a couple things? One, can we talk just a little bit more? about episode 100 uh and what we what we want people to leave voice for the voicemails maybe mm-hmm. leave a nice message for tom too maybe tell tom that he's doing a great job and that he is a soothing voice uh and uh ask us ask us a question or maybe tell us about what maybe if one of your favorite compound experiences you want to tell us a little again? bit about sloan valve why don't you give the phone number again 914 Dakota Se- seven 37 98 is the last four. No, 37. You guys are giving them the wrong numbers now. We can't get yeah, the wrong numbers. You guys got to stop. You guys got to stop. Tom, just say the you're, right, you're right. Obviously, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. Ian, Ian, tell us the number. Obviously, yeah, obviously yeah, you know it. Obviously, I remember it, but because Tom's voice is going to be on the recording, <laughs> I think he should. Yeah, say I it. know it. Like, we know it, but like, know, we'll let I Tom do it. it. Yeah, yeah. All right, number is 914-487-3788. I got the 37 part right. Boom! 3788 is the last four, and that's really important. Uh, Say it one more time, Tom. 914-487-3788. I tried to pick – I got to pick the number. It was very exciting. Tried to pick something with some eights in it for the boss. I thought that was good. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, just just screw 59, huh? We'll just forget that number exists. I think – I think. No, we'll remember that. I think my screen time is really through the roof, but let's do our our Sloan screen time. Uh, Mine's super high today. Get the I people out of here. Business. I get to see Sloan Park every day. No they offense. Little no little offense to Ian that doesn't get to see it every day. Yeah. Not even see, this is a building. This is a weird brag. Not even a weird brag because mine's not that high. But an hour of my time is using the app that I that we use at the facility for working out. So really, you could take an hour off. Uh. My number is five hours and nine minutes. Mine's seven four. Oh, oh my! Oh, I could be on it for two straight hours and I still wouldn't catch you, Dude, Dakota. I'm trying to get some information on this whole lockout thing on my Twitter. Three fifty two. Wow, that's see, but day. I'm at the I'm like at the facility now, so like for like six hours in the morning, I'm nowhere near my down. phone. Thought I was, thought I was gonna win. I don't think I've ever won. I always had four eight. I think I've won once. But see, you no, know, Tom, I'm two hours behind you. Oh, yeah, so I won. You definitely win, because in the, in the next two hours, I'll be on it for more than 16 minutes. I guarantee that. Yes. I have to I have to go and get on a call 
so that we can bring Bay back. I that is the Sloan screen time presented by Sloan. We should say more things about Sloan, including the fact that they make the mushrooms and faucets. They're and ballpark they, in Sloan. They built a park. The ballpark in Mesa is awesome, and they're hanging out there. Uh, and they're probably want people to come to spring training games. But, Tom, what's the number? One more uh, time. One more time for the people. We'll tweet about uh, 914-487-3788. Call us. See you next week for episode 100. Parse. Mm-hmm. I love Parse. 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 Parse.